Yes, sir. There we go. Okay, so you're seeing the opening slide there? I am, yeah. Perfect. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, I want to start by repeating something that uh, other presenters have, have said, and that's to thank the Thunder, thank Dave for, for putting on this program. It's been a great, great learning experience, great resource for all of us, for me. It's been a great escape as well during this really difficult time. So I really sincerely thank the Thunder for doing this. Um, you know, we're all competitive people. Maybe one way we can look at this pandemic is um, that there's still a competition going on. And the question is, is which coaches, which teams are going to use the pandemic time better, um, it, whether that's your team or your opponent. So again, thank you for the Thunder. Thank you to the Thunder for that. Um, I, I recognize a lot of the names. I know lots of the names that I've seen entering the meeting, but I'll introduce myself. Um, as Dave said, my name is Paul Harrison. I'm a position coach with the Lebovis Golden Suns, and I'm also the special teams coordinator with that team. Uh, very proud of that team and what it's accomplished uh, on the field and uh, off the field. Um, off the field, we, we put a lot of kids into uh, post-secondary football with the Thunder, with the Rams, with all kinds of university teams. But the vast majority of our kids hang up their cleats after grade 12 and never play again. And uh, I'd like to think that we give them uh, a really good football experience and give them some, some great tools for life as they carry on. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, I'm also the running backs coach for the Regina Riot. Very proud to be a member of that team. Uh, get to work with a great group of coaches and a very, very diverse group of players. Um, in my position group, I've got a running back who has played for 10 years, who has played for Team Canada, Team Sask. I've got another running back who led our team in rushing last year who'd never played football before last year. He came off a uh, NCAA basketball uh, career. And of course, we've got young players from the Regina Victorias and, and that league, Melville Vipers, Mooseman Generals, and so on. And the point being that we, we again, we deal with a lot of different players with a lot of different backgrounds, and that's certainly fed into this presentation. Uh, I've served as the running backs coach for Team Saskatchewan's U16 program. I've served as a head coach and an assistant coach in the uh, high school spring league. It's a little painful. Tonight is Wednesday, May, what is it, May 6th. There should be a spring league game going on right now. Um, I have been very, very lucky to have been welcomed as a guest coach for the last three training camps with the University of Regina Rams. And I uh, had the very good fortune to spend the 2019 off season with the Regina Thunder working with their running backs group. And then last, but by no means least, I've, I've spent 16 years in the RMF and I, I still am in the RMF. I, I don't have time to be a head coach in the RMF or to be there all the time due to my Lebovis commitments, but it's, uh, it's a great league um, that I can't see walking away from anytime soon. Uh, in real life, uh, I'm a lawyer. I've spent the last 27 years in Regina practicing as a litigation lawyer. And uh, as you may know, as a lawyer, our, our tools are words. Um, those are our tools. Uh, words and language, people's rights, uh, people's outcomes can, can hinge very much on the use of language. And then lastly, those who coach with me would probably agree, I probably got a healthy dose of OCD. Um, not diagnosed, but a healthy dose of OCD. And I think all of those things have combined to, uh, I guess, inspire and feed this particular topic. Language. So the definition of language is that it's a systematic means of communicating by the use of words and symbols which have understood meanings. And I've underlined the word understood because that's the key to language, obviously. Uh, your words and symbols have to be understood. It's why I can't speak Spanish. Uh, I could see a Spanish word and I might be able to pronounce it, might be able to read it, but I wouldn't understand what it means. And therefore my reading and pronouncing of the Spanish language is kind of a pointless exercise. I use the word, I don't understand it. So my theory in this presentation is that more people within the game of football struggle with the language of football than they might let on. And that's players and coaches. Uh, all of us in football can read and pronounce a lot of football words and a lot of football words and symbols. We use them. How well do we understand them? And a big point I, I like to make is that people in football don't let on 
when they don't understand the language of football. Uh, coaches and players, I suggest, have a vested interest in not letting on when they lack understanding. From a player's perspective, you're trying to make a team. You're trying to climb a depth chart. Uh, you're, you're wanting to be seen as coachable. With that in mind, it is not in a player's interest to appear or to admit confusion. What about coaches? Do coaches let on when they don't understand? Uh, I know I don't. Uh, there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of bravado in coaching. Uh, if you want proof of that, think back to any uh, coaching clinic that you ever went to with a really high-end presenter. Um, I'm not talking about in Saskatchewan where we're all nice and down-to-earth people, but go to the Glazier Clinic in Las Vegas and sit in on Lincoln Riley's presentation, uh, the head coach of the University of Oklahoma Sooners, and really watch that when you get to the, the part of the presentation where it's the question and answer period, watch how many coaches in the audience fall all over themselves to appear to be the smartest person in the room. To not really ask questions, but to demonstrate to Lincoln Riley, hey Lincoln, I'm pretty smart too. Um, you can't tell me that there aren't more people that are confused by what coaches like that say. But time and time again, you see that because there is a desire or a real hesitancy to admit that you're confused or that you don't understand something. So focus of this presentation is three things. Number one, who might benefit from a little more attention to linguistics? I realize that it is a bigger issue at certain levels of football, but I'm also convinced it's present at all levels. And I'll hopefully give some examples of where I've seen it at, at all levels. What are some of the language barriers? I'll explain what I mean by that term in some detail for those of you who are sort of sitting back wondering what the hell this guy is talking about so far. And then lastly, how can we as coaches make it better? Kind of a pointless exercise unless we have some ideas for improving things. And here's where I'd like to pause a little bit and to ask you all to start thinking about some input uh, later on in the presentation. Grab a pen, grab your keyboard. And while I'm rambling on, uh, jot down some examples of the football language barrier that you've experienced and that you've seen and any ideas you might have for making things better, especially at the different levels of coaching. So first, who might benefit from a little more attention to linguistics? Uh, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Um, so I found it easier to think about what kind of coaches don't need to worry about this at all. There's no language barrier. There's no language hurdles to them at all. Coaches and players all have very high IQs. Now, if this was an in-person uh, session, I would hope that there would at least be some smirks at that notion of all your players having very high IQs. Uh, coaches whose players all have the same high IQs. I'll give an example. I have two sons. Uh, they both played RMF and high school football. One of them played a little South Sass Selects. Very bright kids, uh, high IQs, but different, as different as can be. Uh, so if I said to my two kids, get your head out of your ass, uh, my oldest, who's a Dean's List student at the University of Toronto in astrophysics, I don't even know what astrophysics is. If I said that to him, he would look at me funny and answer me kind of robotically, well, my head isn't in my ass, I therefore can't remove it from said ass. Right? Very literal thinker. My youngest is in grade 12, an uh, honor roll kid, bit more of a screwball. His head could very well be in his ass. And if I use that phrase with him, it would be more meaningful to him, he'd get the allegory. So again, uh, coaches whose players all have the same IQ. Coaches whose players' brains are all left hemisphere dominant. Uh, you do a little reading on this and the processing and, and uh, uh, manipulation of language is apparently something that functions through your left hemisphere. Most people have a hemisphere or a side of their brain that is more dominant. And for those who are more skilled in language, those are left hemisphere dominant people, apparently. Uh, coaches whose players have all played for the exact same length of time. I'll give a little uh, Leboldus example, Leboldus and University of Regina Rams example for you. Uh, Josh Donnelly and Jerry Weave are two outstanding football players that have very recently come out of Leboldus and are now with the U of R Rams. Uh, very different. Josh Donnelly played Adam football. He played Pee Wee football. He played Bantam football. He played South Sass Selects. He played U16. He played high school spring league. 
and he played U18. Uh, Jerry Weeb played two years of high school football after his buddies saw what a great athlete he was and said, Jerry, you got to play football. Uh, they're now on the same team. They're in the same meeting room. They don't speak the same language. And I don't mean that in any way uh, uh, disrespectfully towards Jerry, who's a phenomenal athlete. I certainly want Jerry running the go route or returning the kick over Josh. But Josh could go toe to toe in a meeting room with, with Mark McConkey. Uh, you probably go toe to toe in a meeting room with Andy Reid of the Kansas City Chiefs. Jerry's not quite at that level. They haven't played the same length of time, but they now find themselves in the same meeting room, uh, learning the same offense. Uh, other coaches who may not have to worry about this, coaches whose players all come from the same feeder team. Doesn't happen. Coaches whose players all have the same attention span. Well, the only attention span I suspect that's in common for, for most coaches is their players have no attention span. So the long and the short of it is, uh, I can't see that there are many coaches who don't need to worry about the linguist, linguistics issue in football. Uh, when I started putting this pro, uh, presentation together, I thought maybe this guy might not need to worry about the football language barrier. Uh, this is Tim Murphy, he's the head coach at Harvard. And going back to the criteria for coaches who don't have to worry about this, it's probably probably satisfies this first one. Coaches whose players all have very high IQs, but after that, uh, you know, Coach Murphy of Harvard, whose his players don't fill all that criteria, and I suspect that he, just like everybody else, uh, will from time to time encounter a football language barrier. Okay, so what are some of these uh, language barriers that I'm talking about? And the first is that the language of football isn't consistent. If you were somebody wanting to learn Arabic, you would soon discover that most letters in Arabic are written in four different symbols, depending on where they're placed in a word. So the ABCs of Arabic are, uh, are spelled out or, or, or written out in four different ways, depending on where they're, where they're placed in a word. Um, wouldn't be hard to imagine somebody saying learning Arabic was a challenge. Um, so could learning the language of football be at all like learning Arabic? Here we've got the four linebackers in a 34 defense, Sam, Mack, and Will. And first of all, it isn't lost on me that probably half the people in the room would call that a mic, but that wasn't my point. The point was about that, that uh, fourth linebacker and what do you call him or her? Because I've seen lots of names. There's the Buck, the Zach, the Ted, the Jack. So again, uh, football can be a little Arabic in its language. If you're wanting to learn Korean, you would soon, soon discover that the typical sentence structure in Korean is subject, object, action. Whereas in English, it's subject, action, object. So whereas we would say, I drink water, in Korean, it would come across as I water drink. Uh, do we have any elements of Korean in football? Right here, we've got a route concept and a name for a route concept, surf. Uh, it's a good uh, intuitive name. It's made up of a slant route and a flat route, surf, slant, flat. But of course, the, it's named from the outside receiver first to the inside receiver. Down here, we've got another good intuitive route name, Jin, go in. But here it's named from the inside receiver to the outside receiver. Now I'm involved in a couple of teams and uh, they do it different ways. Uh, one team names from the inside to the out, the other names from the outside to the in. It's a good thing our receivers don't have to uh, swap teams because you can see something like that uh, being a problem. You wanna talk about consistency. What about this mess? Uh, the D-line technique naming or numbering system. This top one is probably the one that I would say I'm most familiar with right here, where the defensive lineman on the inside shade of the guard is a one tech and the outside is a three tech. And over here on the tight end, we've got the inside shade of the tight end is a seven and the outside is a nine. I found three of these examples. I could find four more. Um, it's not consistent. It's all over the map. And you can see where you could have a real problem. Look at the seven tech alone right here in the one I say I'm familiar with. You tell a kid to go play seven tech 
in my world, he lines up on the inside shade of the tight end. If he's playing on this team here, they wanted him on the outside shade of the tight end. Uh, here we've got a hybrid of the two. The point being is it's just not consistent. And what I find funniest about this particular example of football inconsistency is that we're not trying to cure cancer here, right? We're not explaining the theory of relativity. We're telling defensive linemen, or we're describing where defensive linemen line up. And we create this kind of, a, of an inconsistent mess at times. Consistency or inconsistency isn't the uh, domain only of the defense. Here's offensive hole numbering, or at least one version, and I would suggest one of the most common versions you'd see with the uh, even numbers hole to the right and the odd number holes to the left. And again, I think that's quite common, fairly straightforward. But this one isn't that uncommon either. And this one starts the hole numbering right on the center. And you typically will see this kind of hole numbering system on a team that runs really inside, inside zones or runs the midline. And so they start their hole numbering right on the center. And as you can see, it doesn't change the right side of the line at all, but it dramatically changes the left side of the line. I was at Rams camp uh, last year and a, a young rookie running back was was uh, continually running his three holes too wide. And uh, I, I finally went to him, I said, what do you think the three hole is? And of course he pointed or talked about this three hole concept when in fact it was this. Now, in fairness, that kid had a, a playbook that very clearly told him that uh, this second system was the one in play and he'd been told that in meetings, he told that by his coach. But again, uh, after years of this being his system and this being his language, this one caught him for a loop when the, when the bullets started to fly. Uh, this one here, this used to be Saskatoon. Uh, I don't know if it still is, but it's the exact opposite. Uh, I understand it might still be the way it's done in Saskatoon, but you can imagine what fun that makes for at the U16 and U18 level. And again, all we're trying to do here is tell running backs where to run and linemen what the various hole numbers are. Other examples of the football inconsistency problem. How do you describe the sides of the field? Is it boundary field, wide, short, strong, weak? I'm not sure why this one uh, wasn't a good catch-all, but you don't see it used very often. You see all kinds of different terms. Going back to that 34 defense scenario, we talked about what you call that extra linebacker, Buck, Zach, Jack, Ed, whatever it is. But here's another element to it. What do you call the inside linebacker who lines up next to the Sam in a 34 defense? Is that the Mac or is that that fourth linebacker? And I know for a fact, uh, that there are teams where the offensive coaches look at that differently than the defensive coaches. The offensive coaches say, well, of course, the, the linebacker in a 34 who lines up next to the Sam is the Mac or the Mike. Whereas the defensive coach may say, no, that's our, that's our buck. Not a huge deal, except you're in team time and somebody asks, hey, where did that blitz come from? And the defensive coach says, well, that was our buck. And the offensive coach says, well, no, there's no way. I'm sure that was the Mac talking about the same person. How do you describe an onside kickoff? Well, this is weird, but this is a, another example from real life. This year at La Boldis, I was the special teams coordinator and I, I did up uh, the special teams playbook. And of course we had a kickoff section and we had our various kicks, our, our deep kicks. We had our squib kicks, we had our sky balls and uh, whatnot. We had a section on onside kicks and I described it in the playbook as the, an onside kick. And we get to our, our meetings and I put up the, the drawing of the play and I refer to it as the onside kick. Call it that in practice. We get into a game and we come out after half time and get the go ahead from uh, Coach Ford that we're gonna kick, we're gonna try to catch them off guard and kick onside. So I gather the kickoff team in front of me and say, guys, we're gonna open this second half by uh, short kicking. 
and never would have occurred to me. But three or four of the kids, including the kicker, started trotting out to uh, the 45 yard line thinking that I was talking about a sky ball or a squib or a pooch or something, but not the onside, our classic onside kick. I changed the term. Uh, to me, short kick, onside kick sort of means the same thing. It didn't to them. Um, and I can't blame them because I'd not installed it by using that term. Uh, how do you name the run blocks you ask your slot back to make? Uh, you know, the list is endless there. Uh, do you ask your blocker all of a sudden to log a defender? Uh, or do you ask them to seal a defender inside? Again, these are things that just come out of your mouth at any given time in a practice or game situation that can be really inconsistent and can be confusing. So if you identify your five receiver set by letters, what are those letters and do they switch sides? I've got two examples there, W, X, Y, R, Z, and then X, S, R, Y, Z. We've got two teams in this city who use those two different uh, identification systems. Uh, you'll notice one position is treated the same. One receiver position out of five is treated the same between those two teams. So what are some of the other language barriers besides inconsistency? Is the language of football intuitive? Now, being intuitive means having the ability to understand something naturally without the need for detailed instruction or complicated reasoning. So the ability to understand something naturally without the need for detailed instruction or complicated reasoning. You hear that and you say, isn't that how we would like our football players to learn without needing detailed instruction or complicated reasoning? A little about intuition. Uh, apparently intuition operates through the right side of the brain. I talked about the uh, language processing operating through the left side. Apparently intuition operates through the right side. Uh, and as well, it's apparently some, some, some real science to intuition as it runs through or works through the neurotransmitter activity in your stomach, thus the term gut feeling. So the question is, if we want players to behave and learn intuitively, do we use intuitive language in football? A few examples, how about route, pass route combination names? Are they intuitive? All hook, yeah, I would say all hook is definitely intuitive. The route looks like a hook, and everybody's running it. All hook, very intuitive, great. Uh, oak, uh, standing for out curl. Yeah, that's intuitive as well. Or coke, corner out curl. Again, very intuitive. But along with those, you often see, and I've seen these uh, in town uh, and in various teams, phrases or, or route combination names that aren't intuitive. I'm not saying it's crippling or that these receivers are walking around not knowing what they're doing, but they aren't very intuitive. Uh, razorback, esky, hogfish. These are all route combination names. There may be something intuitive to them. It could be me. It probably is me. But again, uh, are we using intuitive language as much as we can? Now, I'm not just talking about the complicated system terms or scheme terms in football and whether they are uh, unintuitive and being understood. What I wonder about sometimes are some of the most commonly used terms in football, intuitive and understood by everybody, or are some staying silent and unsure? And I've got lots of examples. Play action. What is it about uh, faking a handoff and then passing that says play action? Had a player that is now playing university football out east. Uh, very smart kid, bilingual, French immersion student, good football player. Didn't really know what play action was. Uh, and this quote is from him. He said to me at one point, well, isn't every snap of the ball a play with action? I said, yeah, it's not a bad point. Plats, right? We ask people to cover them. We ask people to run patterns into them. The flats, the whole field is flat. Cut, this is probably more of a consistency term. Uh, we have cut coverage, where uh, the D-backs are, uh, the, the cornerbacks are covering the flats. We have cut blocks, right, where we're taking people out low. We have agility moves that we ask people to make. 
And finally, we cut people and remove them from the team. Pulling guard. Uh, this is one I experienced uh, at a junior camp, Thunder Camp, uh, working with the running backs, a young fellow uh, trying out, coming out of high school. Um, decent player, credible player. I don't think the kid made the team, but he was a reasonable player, and he came from a sophisticated school where he was well coached. Um, we were running power, and he was not following and cutting off his guard. And so I said to him, you know, you, you've got to follow and cut off your pulling guard. And he kind of nodded at me and gave me a funny look. And I said, you know what a pulling guard is, don't you? And he didn't. He knew what a guard was, but the pulling part he didn't understand. Well, why is that pulling? And I said, well, that's the guard that you know, comes out of his stance uh, and runs parallel to the line of scrimmage before heading up the field. Uh, interestingly enough, that was a kid who had a, a hearing disability as well. And, and so you have little things like that that can add to the language barrier mix. But again, who would ever think that somebody on the field doesn't know what pulling means? Uh, waggle. A um, couple things. You go Google that term in football. And in the United States, it means something different where you've got uh, very different motion rules. Uh, waggle in the United States more often than not refers to a type of bootleg uh, passing play option. Uh, on the riot last year, our, our running back, the, uh, the player I was telling you about, her name's Rebecca. She's, uh, again, hadn't played football before. Um, very, very good athlete, played NCAA basketball. Knew how to practice, knew how to compete. Um, approaches the game very, very seriously, very professionally. It's a term that didn't mean anything to her. And at one point she said, well, is that that runny uppy thing? And I said, yes, Rebecca, that's, that's waggle is the runny uppy thing. And I thought I was going to laugh and say, well, that's kind of a trivial, uh, trivial uh, juvenile way to describe it. And then I thought, as opposed to what? Waggle? It's not really the most dignified regal term out there. But, uh, uh, draw. You know, why is a, a, a delayed handoff deep in the backfield a draw? Uh, but I do know that defensive players are expected to react to that word when their sideline starts screaming, draw, draw, draw in the middle of a play. Scramble. Uh, I've encountered this with receivers going over scramble rules. Sit down, talk to the receivers about how the, uh, the, the short breaking routes need to turn the upfield and the deep breaking routes need to come back towards the quarterback. Um, and they sort of nodded, got that concept. And then somebody says, well, what's scramble and who's scrambling? Uh, it's our quarterback in some jeopardy. Uh, again, assumptions that things are understood that may not be. Kick out, you know, the block that drives a defender towards the sideline. I'm going to pause with a, a bit of an interesting football language scenario. And it happened uh, with us this fall at La Boldus. All of a sudden, a six foot three, 285 pound athlete shows up at camp and, and wants to try football. Huge, strong, aggressive. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world and certainly not the best coach in the world, but I'm smart enough to know that when a physical specimen like that shows up at your camp and wants to try football, uh, you probably want to see if you can make things work for the fellow. Uh, this fellow is a recent immigrant to Canada. Background is in wrestling and boxing which of course makes him even more appealing as a, as a football player, but does nothing for his football background. Uh, the extent of his uh, football knowledge or football experience was he'd seen a few highlight clips of what he called American football in passing. Um, so you get somebody like that and it happens all the time in high school, but it probably happens sometimes in uh, junior and university. I know when I spent last uh, training camp with the Rams, they had a young man who, again, a similar story, a, a, just a physical specimen who wanted to try football. And this fellow came out, and I still remember how excited everybody got when he got on the field in the, in the preseason game. So it, it, I think it happens at, at all levels, happens all the time in high school. But with a fellow like this, the, the language barrier is going to surface um, long before you start talking to him about playing the seven tech or the one tech or, or various, stu uh, various stunts. It's gonna come up when you say to them, it's third down, get ready, third down. So you're a representative of the human race and you've been assigned the task of explaining to uh, 
aliens from another universe, what's a down? Uh, could you do it? It's a try, it's an attempt, I guess. You say to them, you're gonna need to be a yard off the line of scrimmage. The what? The line of what? Well, the, the invisible line that runs from sideline to sideline at the point the ball is placed. Uh, the, the starting line for the offense. Pretty important term since we want him to be a yard off of it. Uh, don't listen to the quarterback's cadence, right? Again, terms that you would never think twice about throwing out there um, that would be lost on a player like this. And, and you know, you ask yourself, is, is he'll have to catch up the very best we can do for a kid like that? And at our level, at least at high school, the answer is no. Right, and, and our defensive coaches did a fantastic job at Leboldis, uh, working with the fellow, getting to the point where he was a starter on the nose for us. He, and most importantly, he wasn't frustrated. He loves football. He's diving into it and is coming back to play. Um, again, uh, I think in that case, that's an example of certainly being very sensitive to the football language barrier and, and doing a little bit better than just saying, look, he's going to have to catch up. Um, so how do we make it better as coaches? Uh, first of all, here's what I'm not suggesting. I'm not suggesting total standardization. Team codes, secrets, terms, they'll still matter. Um, although I got to confess, some of them are kind of silly and you see them, you know, Roger, Louie, Ringo, Lucky. And I say kind of why bother? Uh, anybody with a pulse should know that that's right and left. Um, but anyways, I'm not suggesting total standardization. And I'm not suggesting abandoning everything that isn't intuitive because people do have to learn. And I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting making everything overly simple, right? I says, I say here, we don't get the full experience if we just stay with Dr. Seuss and, and never move on to Shakespeare or to Dickens. So how do we make it better as coaches? A, a few ideas. Uh, the first is regular awareness and monitoring of something that we don't often monitor, and that's the words that we use. I can promise you that after every game, I will uh, go on to the game film, and I will monitor uh, every play that the running back runs, uh, whether they made the right reads, uh, whether their insert point was correct, whether they had good ball security, whether their pad level was higher low, I will monitor that on every play. Why can't I monitor what comes out of my mouth a little bit more, or what I put on paper a little bit more than I do? And I don't. Uh, I catch it way after the fact. Uh, so again, awareness and monitoring of it. Uh, here's the second one. Try to, try to be articulate. I'm not suggesting you everybody walks around like uh, Abraham Lincoln delivering the Gettysburg Address or whatever, but, but speak, try to speak clearly. Try to use the correct words in, in the right places. I know football often um, kind of celebrates the Mike Ditka style where, where tough, virtually incomprehensible language is celebrated. But, you know, Bill Walsh, Tom Landry, those guys were pretty successful too. So maybe up our game a little bit in, in being articulate. This is a big one. Admit to players and coaches that we don't always understand the language being used. Uh, easier said than done. Uh, but important. Maybe one of the ways you can force that out of people is to introduce a review of a confusing term of the day, confusing term of the week in your position group or on your offense, defense, or special teams. This one I think might be uh, the best idea, at least in my mind, and that's spend an extra five seconds being a thesaurus. Thesaurus, of course, is a collection of alternative words for a given term. So when you're coaching, uh, try to spend an extra five seconds being a thesaurus. So uh, we need to run this at the three tech, which is the defensive lineman lined up on our guard's outside shoulder. Uh, you need to kick out the end just to block them toward the sideline. Again, that's added about three or four seconds to your day. Um, and you never know when that sort of thesaurus activity will pay off for you. Put a glossary in your playbook. Um, but be careful, don't fill your glossary with the terms that you think are complex and need explaining. Um, because you know, hopefully we've all got the benefit of some experience and time in the game that 
that uh, we will be a little less confused about some of the terminology. That's not our audience, of course. Uh, include well-established terms that you think you don't need to include. Maybe take 10 terms. I'm doing up my glossary. Here's 10 terms that I don't think that I should have to include, but I'm going to include them because somebody out there in the audience might get something out of that when reading the glossary. Um, get visual. Uh, draw the three tech. Draw the five receiver set. Uh, have players draw it out. Uh, interaction. Uh, I'm told uh, by teacher friends that, that one of the best ways to learn is to learn a concept is to try to teach the concept. Um, so that could help. Uh, try to pick a term and stick to it. And I'll use my example. If I label it as an onside kick in the playbook and in the install sessions and in practice, don't get excited when we come out to start a second half and say, guys, we're going to short kick here. Be consistent in your terminology. Um, maybe tap into a staff member who's good at this or has put some time or thought into this. Um, teachers. I've always found that teachers are a great uh, addition to any football staff because coaching, of course, is teaching. Teachers, um, I always find, are, are very calm, very measured. And whereas I may want to go off and, and, you know, make bold pronouncements and get upset and get mad, write somebody off or whatever, the teachers are always the ones saying, oh, no, no, no just, just hold on. And they calmly work through things. So that's an aside. That's an additional quality they've got. But, but you know, can you have a language coach on your team? Um, be careful about that. I think it's a decent and interesting idea, but we've all experienced the, uh, the parent who walks around annoying us by correcting our grammar all the time. You don't want that. Um, but maybe there's somebody on the staff that's more aware of this and can be tasked with from time to time monitoring uh, language. And maybe that's just simply as a, a coach is speaking up in a meeting, uh, using a term, uh, the language coach in the back of the room can speak up and say, so uh, coach, just to be clear, when you say uh, play action, you mean, of course, you use, probably use a little more complicated terminology than that, but that's an, that's an example of what I'm getting at. Um, some other ideas about how we make it better as coaches. <clears throat> Ask players to predict outcomes in meeting time, and that'll give you a hint of whether or not they understand the concept you're teaching. So ask the running back, what happens when we show play action? And if the running back's answer is, well, uh, we'll freeze the linebackers and we'll prevent them from dropping into their pass coverage zones, you got a pretty good idea that they understand the term. Uh, if they say, well, uh, when we show play action, the crowd goes wild because everybody loves plays with lots of action, uh, you'll have a pretty good idea that maybe that's a term that they don't understand so well. And, uh, you need to spend some time on them a little. Uh, and it's again, it's a way of finding out what they don't understand without making them necessarily step forward and admit that they don't understand something. Um, position group chats, very common now on teams. Uh, I think they're probably a great place for learning language and terminology. Uh, if the players know it already and you put it in writing on the chat group, they'll just skip past it. No harm done. Uh, if they don't understand it, though, they'll have it written out. They'll have it written out right there in the privacy of their own home to read and reread without having to, again, put their hand up and say, uh, I don't understand this. Uh, test them. Uh, give them homework assignments. You often see teams give out homework assignments where they want players to draw out defensive fronts, coverages in X's and O's. Um, what about testing them in, la in a format using language? You know, what is our slush block? I'm going to ask you the question in language, answer me in language. Um, catch yourself. Catch yourself when you're on a lingo roll. Um, we get on them. If your listeners are unsure about what your lingo is, there's a good chance they'll be nervous and shut down. Uh, think back to being in a completely foreign language environment uh, where people are chattering around you. How, how comfortable were you? Um, if allowed by your coordinator or head coach and the time is right, hover on the edge of the huddle at practice with two to three word hints. Uh, last winter at the rookie camps with the Thunder, um, 
you know, there were a lot of, of players learning a lot of brand new terms and uh, we'd go through Pascal or inside run. And I, I, I asked coach Ensign, I'd say, Hey, look, can I just hover on the edge of the huddle? And when the huddle breaks, catch the running backs eyes on every play with the one or two or three word little uh, guide, like guards inside foot or seven yard out or something like that. Um, and he, he was fine with that. He thought it was fine. He, he agreed that, that at least at that point, that wasn't the time where these players had to fly on their own or fly solo, um, but could maybe benefit from those quick little hints, uh, avoid some assignment errors that kind of shut down the period for, for the rest of the team. Um, so what are the benefits uh, of getting better at football linguistics? Well, there's a few. Um, first, I suspect decreased personal frustration for all involved. Uh, we know in our, in our relationships, uh, at our workplace, how often uh, communication or language is at the root of frustration. You know, how often have people said, was it something I said? Uh, again, hopefully we can correct that a little bit. Uh, this, is, this is blatantly obvious, but less mistakes tied solely to misunderstood language. Now, how often have you had that situation where a disaster has just happened on the field? And the player comes over and says to you, well, I thought that meant this. Now, if you can pick off or eliminate one or two of those, it's well worth it. Uh, players play faster when they're confident in their understanding. I suspect that's well known. This is kind of an interesting concept that you can read about in, in kinesiology, uh, where they talk about the quiet eye zone. And I think if we get bad, better at football linguistics, players can spend more time in the quiet eye zone. What, what that is, apparently, is uh, it's that period of time after an athlete uh, receives and uh, understands their assignment, and then they transition to the quiet eye zone, where they're absorbing uh, location, distance, targets, landmarks, all that kind of thing. If you think about the baseball player um, at the point where they get in the batter's box, they do their little warm-up swings, and now they're at the point where they're watching the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand. That's the, what they call the quiet eye zone. And apparently it's, uh, it's to every athlete's advantage to spend more time in the quiet eye zone. Um, and obviously again, uh, getting better at football linguistics will make for a much better use of, of people's time and, <clears throat> and not um, dealing with these things at inopportune times. Excuse me. Okay bit of an interaction period to close it off uh, or questions. Uh, I'm just saying that when, whenever you call for questions, it implies that you have the answers. And I don't pretend that I have the answers. I'll certainly feel questions. Um, what I'm also interested in probably as much is going back to what I said earlier in the presentation. I'd really like to hear some of your examples, if you've got them, of poor football linguistics and how to make it better. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Am I overstating the issue? Maybe I am. Um, I'm, as I say, I'm convinced it's present at every level, but obviously to different degrees. Uh, I'd be curious to hear uh, what your highest level example of, of uh, uh, the football language barrier is and the lowest level. So by that, I mean, uh, you know, have you, have you coached at the pro level where you've seen some uh, really surprising examples of, of the football language barrier kicking in? Obviously, at the lower levels, we'll have all kinds of examples of that. But with that, yeah, if there's interaction, if there's questions or some of those comments, I, I'd appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah, Coach Harrison, we've got a couple questions here. Uh, again, coaches on with us, uh, you do have the ability to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask it yourself. If not, uh, you can continue to put them in the chat, uh, either to everyone or send them to, to me privately and I'll be happy to read them off, but you do have the option to uh, give yourself the video and the ability to speak. Uh, Coach Harrison, first question is, what is your suggestion for resolving the situation you described where an O, where O and D coaches use different terms for the same thing? Who should take responsibility in that confusion? I don't, I don't think you can resolve it. I don't, I don't, my guess is you're not going to get an offensive coach to convince the defensive coach that they need to change the way they describe things. I think what you got to do is um, if you're an offensive coach and that 
and that inconsistency comes up, you have to make a real concerted point of grabbing your offensive players and saying, look, they say it that way. That's fine. We describe it this way, right? You will have me describe it as the Mac linebacker. Coach Joe may describe it as the buck. We're talking about the same thing. I think you've got to just not overstep your bounds and stay within your side of the ball and just make sure you um, you explain it to your, your players. I would be very surprised if you would, if you would get both sides of the ball to say, Oh yes, yeah, I agree. We should, let's, uh, we're going to, we're going to change how we've been naming that because we're going to, we're going to, we're going to describe that term the way you guys over there do. Awesome. Uh, uh, next one here is, uh, how much input do you allow your athletes to have when choosing language for plays or playbooks? Well, some, I mean, so much of that is done before they, before they uh, uh, arrive. Um, but um, I'm trying to think of some examples. I, and I, there are, um, I can think of some both from the boldest and the riot where, you know, early in the season or part way through the season, um, somebody, expressed a, a confusion with a term and sometimes um, what happens is they is they use a totally different term or a, or not a totally different term but a term that is close to the one we're using but slightly different and so geez that's not a bad way to put it uh let's go with that um so yes yeah, definitely some input Then another question we have is, and I know I've experienced this myself, but when you have coaches arguing over particular vernacular or, or language to be used for things, you know, what, what, in your experience, both in football and maybe, you know, in, in your real job, what's the best way to resolve that issue in your mind? You know, is it the, the current team stick with that term? Is it the new employee or the new coach? coming in who's using the terms do you let them roll with it or what, what have you done in your experience well you'd hope that the way it would work is that uh whether it be a in my job or in football that <clears throat> that ultimately the best terminology would prevail um and i you know uh, i guess it's a credit to human nature that's what i found happens most often both in, in work and in football is that the best terminology will eventually prevail. Um, and you need to sell it sometimes. Um, but I haven't found many, many coaches who are so stuck in a particular word or phrase that they just cannot move off it. Um, there's, there's different flexibility I've seen. Um, play names, route names, I find there's quite a willingness to adjust and modify that. Um, you know, where I threw up the defensive line technique numbering system. Some are, have spent a lot of time on something like that, and they have a hard time, um, you know, reprogramming themselves. And maybe that, maybe that's not time well spent to reprogram themselves. But I do think, I guess to answer the question, the simplest way is that in both, both scenarios, You'd hope that the best use of terminology will prevail, and that's actually what I, I think I've seen happen more often than not. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, another one here is asking, do you, uh, sorry, I lost my spot here. Do you know of teams that have created a glossary of football terms within the team? Yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, simply put, yes. Um, I, I've seen, I've seen uh, the glossaries expand to, uh, you know, drawings of the field, right, with the dimensions of the field, um, drawings of how the huddle should look, um, you know, basic things like that, and then going into, just like you'd flip through an encyclopedia, uh, an alphabetical glossary. Um, the difference is, is the type of glossary you see. Um, some teams, the glossary is, is quite high end. And it's, it's, I, I think it's probably the terminology that the coach sitting down saying, well, this is a, in my mind, this is a confusing term. And then there are teams where the glossary is, is 
more directed at a, uh, uh, a, a player and a player who's, um, you know, football language is more basic. And I, I kind of, I'm not sure why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't just uh, go with the latter, the more basic one, um, you know, might add a couple extra pages, I suppose. But again, you never know which, uh, which players out there have certain terms that, that that you throw around that they don't they don't know what it is and I, you know i'm looking at you uh dave you know you've coached at all kinds of levels you've been up at the pro level have you seen examples at the pro level where you're surprised um by uh, a lack of understanding of some terminology that you thought must have been under or should have been understood well yeah coach i can think of a particular example just last season um, we were in Toronto and something that you would assume would be relatively simple. And that's the problem right there is assuming, uh, but we're talking field goal D and the term I use is you know, talking to the corners and the halfbacks about bracketing the backfield set, which in my experience has been a common term throughout, but with that particular team, it wasn't. And uh, the players weren't doing what I asked them to do. And so finally I asked them, do you understand what I mean when I say bracket? I want you outside of the backfield set, keeping them inside of you. Oh, a bracket, you know, and yeah. then it finally clicked. But me just saying bracket meant nothing to those particular players. And it was a kind of an aha moment for myself as a coach. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely something that happens at every single level from youth all the way up to the highest levels. Yeah. Uh, we, we got another one here that's asking, what is something that we as minor football coaches coaching nine aside should prepare a player for some of the language and terminology when they go to camps that are based on the 12 aside game? Oh, boy. I've never coached nine aside. Um, well, I guess I might stay away at, at a nine aside level. If you're wanting, if you're thinking about prepping for the 12 aside game, I might stay away from some of the numbering schemes that are used at, at 12 aside for like holes and so on. Um, because I'm assuming that you don't necessarily have people at all of those holes. Right, so maybe you're you're uh, uh, you don't need to use numbering to describe uh, holes. You can you can uh, um, use right or left, and then just simply teach the play as being run at a at a certain direction in terms of a player orientation to an offensive lineman, for instance. So instead of, of talking to your players about you know a five hole uh, run, um, you know I'm not they may not experience that at the, at the nine man game. Um, so uh, th that's one thing that comes to mind is, is eliminating some of the numbering that you see in the 12 man game. Um, I guess the other thing I'm thinking of is, uh, yeah, you've got a number of positions that just aren't on the field in the 12 man game or in, sorry, in the nine man game as well. And there's really no substitute for that. Um, you know, in fairness, I almost think that you'd have to dedicate some of your practice time to uh, uh, to explaining the 12 man game. You know, this is where the uh, tight end would be if there was a tight end or the tackle or the safety or however you line up in the nine man game. That's a really good question. I didn't answer it very well. Um, that's quite a challenge that I've never actually thought of. And that's, uh, coaches, if you do have any more questions, you're welcome to get that in here. Um, I'm seeing one pop up now as I'm speaking. Okay, another uh, comment from Coach Rogers saying that they got rid of every number on offense except for the number of protectors in pass. All numbers mean pass. Okay, so okay. Maybe being a little bit... Is that, is that going back to the, to the nine... 
the nine man, 12 man question. <clears throat> that that's one of the things they did. They got... um, no, I think it's independent. I think it's just a comment of talking about consistency, you know, all numbers mean pass and something else need, means yeah. run. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that's what that means there. Yeah. Um, and then another coach is saying same scenario for the six man player coaches at the next level. We'll have to take time to teach our players their terminology, you know, kind of picking back. We've got six man, we've got nine man, we've got 12 man, uh, you know, having to incorporate and you add in next level terminology when you're going from one level to the next. Yeah. And I shouldn't make too much out of the whole, you know, example of the, the whole numbering system. Cause I know uh, a lot of teams don't bother with the numbering at all. You know, they, they, they give a direction to the run and the players know that for that certain play, you know, the blocking is at a certain point and the running backs insert point is at a certain place. And they do that without reference to any specific number. Uh, that's that's very common. So I shouldn't I shouldn't overemphasize that whole numbering system. Now uh, I see a question pop up here, and I, I I was actually thinking the same thing. Going back to your short kick versus onside kick, <laughs> yeah. when you when you had the the misunderstanding of terminology, what was the result of the play? Um, I I frantically uh, went way too far onto the field, and and flapped my arms and brought them all back in closer. And, and I think I probably just said onside, onside, real shrewd, but didn't want to burn a timeout. Yeah, that one, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's quite an example. I don't, you know, but again, I, I don't blame the players on that one. No, absolutely. And I'll just offer another example you know, to speak to the six man, the nine man, the 12 man game, and, you know, all the way up to the pros dealing with the Canadians and the Americans. I remember here in Saskatchewan in 2015, we were well into the season. I would like to say at least the second half of the season, if not closer to the end than, than the beginning. And in special teams, we've got players all over. And I asked one player to go stand on the 55 yard line. <laughs> and he looked at me like I had three eyeballs. Yeah. Been there all that time and had never realized that there was a 55 yard line, yeah. an extra 10 yards of space. So, you know, it goes back to don't assume players know things. It might be a silly thing. Yeah, you should know that. But, you know, not everybody knows all the rules, not everybody knows all the terms. And when you start to assume, that's where you get yourself in trouble as a coach. Well, I, I was found myself um, a number of years ago in Texas watching. I wasn't coaching. I was watching my son. He was playing in that South Sass Selects program uh, against the Texas team. And for some reason, they needed somebody to do the stadium announcing. And I got roped into it somehow. I don't know how that happened. But I kept, you know, there was these flags on the play. And I'd keep announcing that, that somebody had just uh, uh, been penalized for procedure. And I kept saying procedure and all of a sudden like these heads in the stands would turn and look like, what is this guy talking about? And eventually I apologized over the loudspeaker for speaking Canadian and said, sorry, false start. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Well, I think that does us for uh, questions, coach. Uh, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give some more thought to that nine man question that somebody asked me because I didn't answer what I offered there. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. You can go away with something to think about. Um, co coaches, I'll remind you, uh, check out that YouTube page. You can just search for it on YouTube, search for three phases coaching. Uh, it's got, it'll have tonight's presentation from coach Harrison and all the other ones we've done uh, since back in January. Um, looking to get to hundred subscribers on that. And tomorrow <coughs> we'll be back with uh, coach Shep. Uh, he'll be talking front seven defense. He'll be on the whiteboard. Um, so that would be a fantastic time that if you have suggestions or questions about some scenarios that you want to go up and, 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 and have them draw out on the board and talk things out, uh, that's fantastic. So uh, be prepared for that. Coach Harrison, thank you very much. Uh, I love the value that you provided tonight. 
and uh, we're happy to serve all the coaches uh, here in Saskatchewan. So thanks again, sir. Thanks for having me.